I started teaching in higher education in 1991 when I was doing a master's degree in dance research and reconstruction at City College, and they offered me a teaching fellowship if I was willing to teach aerobics, uh, which was sort of hilarious because I'd only ever taken one aerobics class in my life. <laughs> but I learned how to teach it, and I started that. I continued teaching it as an adjunct, all face-to-face -face courses for many years until I came here in 2008 in a tenure-track full-time line. And about four years in, I believe around 2012, we had been using, doing a dance appreciation course that was face-to-face, -face, that was a general education course that counts for their arts credit. And I thought, you know, this is a perfect course to move to a hybrid format because why am I sitting watching videos with them when they could watch videos on their own? And then when they come to class, we could do more discussion and more experiential work of actually dancing dance instead of just talking about it or watching it. So I changed that whole format to have them watch videos at home and so we would meet one day a week, and then they would have other um, assignments to do online the other day of the week. And then that got going, and then I started thinking, hmm, wonder if this could actually be a fully online course. All the experiential activities, we moved into things like they would send a video of themselves doing three ballet steps. And there was an ABT online video dictionary of ballet steps, so they would watch that and pick three steps and send them to me. Then they did tap step same way, and then they learned the box step for the social dance um, unit. And it was pretty successful. It was a little harder at first because some people had trouble with the video. It was before everybody had smartphones. And so the video was a little hard for some people and I had to allow them to do photographs or something or a description of themselves trying it. Uh, but nowadays that's really not an issue. They all figure it out and send it to me. When we began talking about developing an MFA in dance, we decided that we wanted to do a low residency degree program that would be for returning professionals. So this was about three, four years ago, and we wanted it designed so that people could continue their careers. If they were performers, if they were choreographers, if they were teachers, that they could continue their careers while pursuing their MFA, and that they could be across the country, they could be, we have a student right now who lives in Belgium, that they could be around the world basically and still do the degree program. That they would come here in June for one four-week session, two years, where we would meet them on site and work with them on site in classes that were all face to face. And then the rest of their coursework would be done online. So then we had to, to begin uh, developing those courses and I developed three of them. So I did dance pedagogy, dance in the arts in the 20th century and research writing and publication. And I worked with Joe Russo to get it all loaded up online. I figured out what I wanted to do and then got it all loaded up online. I like to build personal connections with the students, and of course that's a little bit easier to do face-to-face -face than online. So when I'm teaching online, I try to make sure that I answer emails really quickly, um, that I'm really responsive to that. So I know some teachers have a practice that they only answer emails once a day and they only answer Monday through Friday, and I'm not like that. I really will answer emails when I get up in the morning up until when I go to bed at night. Um, if it feels like it needs an immediate response, and particularly with the online courses, I feel like they need to know somebody's there. I also try to grade quickly, so I try to grade, I usually grade within 48 hours. It might go up to a week, uh, depending on my personal schedule, but I try to grade within 48 hours so that they have um, information on how I graded the first assignment before they're moving on to the next assignment so that they you know, begin to understand what my expectations are. I think if you wait too long to grade, um, then students can be doing the same, uh, have the same issues over and over with how they're answering questions and they're not getting feedback from you to try to modulate how they do it. I also have begun recently, and this is a kind of a new strategy on my part, of even with the undergraduates in the face-to-face -face courses of allowing them to redo assignments. So if they haven't answered it, they didn't misunderstood a question, or maybe I asked that they cite the textbook and they didn't cite the textbook, I do allow them to go back in and redo within a certain amount of time, like 48 hours or something like that, because I realize that the whole point is that they learn the material. So if I just give them a zero, and then they move on to the next thing, it means they didn't learn the material. So I do allow them to redo. Also discussion boards I think are really important in the online courses because that allows the students to connect with each other, particular and with me, but particularly in the online courses where they're not sitting together in class, I think it allows them to have their own discussions. Um, certainly with the MFA students, I get excited when they start answering the discussion board questions because 
they have such diverse backgrounds. I mean, we have people who've danced with Yvonne Rayner, with Camille A. Brown, with Mark Morris, um, people who choreograph extensively, who run their own companies, who teach in K through 12, who teach in college. It's such a range of experiences that their responses to the questions are really, really fascinating. So I love that part because I learn as they're learning, but it's also fun to get to know them in those discussion boards. And I actually have started using discussion boards even in my face-to-face -face classes because I think it allows the students to have um, a conversation, ongoing conversation, and then we can touch on it briefly in class, but allows them to learn outside of class um, in a different way. So my online teaching has affected my face-to-face -face teaching. My students in general like that I'm organized. I know in the, in the feedback forms that they fill out at the end of the semester, they like that I'm organized, that the course is planned out from the beginning to the end before the class starts, that my assignments are explained really well. And um, I have worked hard on that. And um, Joe Russo has helped too because he also looked through the course as I was developing it. And, and so I had a, a second eye on editing um, whatever the homework assignment description is. Uh, I also do find that as the course gets taught, if I realize that students aren't understanding something, I go back in immediately and go on and fix it so that the next time it runs, it's already in there, that I don't have to remember to go back and fix it. I do it right then. I do think that students need information on how you grade and what you're looking for. And if you wait too long, like you let things build up and then at midterm you grade assignments from the past you know, two months, um, they don't, it doesn't help them. Uh, as much as it does if you're giving them constant feedback. Because different teachers have different expectations. So if I say you need to cite the textbook, you get a zero if you don't cite the textbook. Other teachers might give them partial credit or just not notice, I don't know. I mean, because I, I, I get a lot of students that that seems like a new thing for them that they need to cite the textbook. But if I'm requiring a textbook, I'm requiring it because it's a really good textbook and there's a lot of information in there and that I, I want them to read it so that they, they're um, gaining all the information they can about the topic that the course centers on. So I do use humor. Certainly when I'm teaching face-to-face, -face, I, I use a lot of humor. And I tell um, you know, a few personal stories. I try not to overburden them with that, but relevant stories, which they like to hear about my teaching in the past. Um, so stories about teaching in elementary school if I'm teaching one of the pedagogy courses, or um, stories about teaching in the undergraduate program if I'm teaching the MFA, MFA students. So they like that sort of... Um, I guess it brings it down to real life as opposed to just sort of studying theory. Then you're seeing how the theory falls down into practice. And so I think that is um, beneficial. I, I do lecture some, particularly in the history courses with the undergraduates. I do lecture a little bit, but even when I'm lecturing, I stop and answer questions all the time or ask them questions because um, I, I really believe that that's how they engage more, that when you're just lecturing at them, the material can just sort of float by as they're dreaming about what they're going to eat for dinner. Um, and so I, I really enjoy class discussions. And they often have insights that are um, you know, really, really um, illuminating that make me think about something in a different way. So uh, I really do love class discussions. And not that I would eliminate lectures completely, but I tend to do more class discussion and hands-on um, activities. Like um, in the Dance for Children class, we actually teach on, teach on site at Bradford School. And in the online courses, I have built hands-on activities. So like in the dance pedagogy course for the MFA students, they're required to go out and watch master teachers so that it takes them away from their computer. So even though it's an online course, it's not only just working at my computer, but it takes them away to do things in their communities, in their environments, and then bringing that information back. So teaching online for me, some of the benefits are that my time is more flexible. So I actually live in the city and I commute here. Um, and it means that uh, you know I might choose to work at home one day and grade all day long, rather than deal with the commute through the Lincoln Tunnel, which is, you know, can be quite interesting. I also can organize my time differently. Um, if I need to be at the library one day, then you know, it's, it just it allows me to work on my own research and do the other things that I do as part of a university professor uh, without feeling tied that I have to be here at, at one specific time in a classroom at a specific time. So that's probably the benefit for me, the, mo the biggest benefit. I also learned to, I also love to learn, and so teaching the online courses was a new experience and is a new experience, and so that's fun for me too, just um, developing something new and trying different st teaching strategies. Uh, I like to keep things fresh all the time. So I tend to teach the same courses, but I redevelop them and re-envision them, and the online teaching uh, allows me to do that, to kind of look at learning in a different way and think of new ways to develop that teaching-learning relationship. 
For the students, I think there's several benefits. One is the same as me, is that they, it allows them more flexibility. So if they have a full-time job and can't get here during the day, they can take a course and they can do the work at night. They can do it in the middle of the night. They can do it in the morning because I teach asynchronously. So they don't have to be at their computer at some specific time. They can do it whenever they like within a given time frame. We actually have a space crunch in the dance program. We don't have a huge number of studios. We have four studios, and two of them are state-of-the-art, gorgeous studios, but we run a whole undergraduate program. So that was one of the other benefits for us as a department, was that it allows us to run this program and not have conflicts with space between the MFA program and the undergraduate program. Some of the biggest challenges in teaching online are feeling disconnected from the students, and I've talked about that a lot, but that's one of the reasons I try to respond to them very quickly when they need something. Um, I think one of the other challenges is to develop these activities where they're away from their computers, so it doesn't all become I'm staring at my computer learning. Um, I want them not to just dive into the digital world, but to be in the real world and bring that back to the digital world. That's definitely one of the things that I try to incorporate into the course, but I think that's the danger of online courses is that it becomes you and the computer for hours at a time. And I don't think that that's beneficial for any of us. Um, I actually really, we're seeing higher levels of anxiety and even higher suicide rates in young people these days. And there's some studies that are relating it back to social media and screen time. And I'm not sure there are any definitive answers yet. I don't want to encourage me and my cell phone or my computer, just, just us, just we're, this, we're moving through this world and we're the only things here. I really want them to engage with other people and to engage with the world around them and to use the digital environment to enhance that. My experience teaching face-to-face, -face, I think I have developed my Canvas courses more. Uh, when I, before I had taught online courses, you know, the, I would have a syllabus online and maybe the course schedule, but I didn't really do anything else. And as I've developed these online courses, I've added other things to my face-to-face -face courses. So, well, we actually, the, our dance history course for the undergraduates, which is called Western Theatrical Dance Studies, is a hybrid course now. So I developed that into a hybrid course because having the experience with dance appreciation that they really can watch the videos on their own, that's what I did with the undergraduate Western Theatrical Dance Studies course, was let them watch the videos on their own and then come back and we would reflect on it. And they have questions to answer that sort of guide them to what I'm looking for um, as they're watching the videos. What I want them to look for is they're watching the videos. But I also started, instead of them handing in paper journals, like for my ballet class where they kept a daily journal, they did it online, which I think is a little easier for them often because they... They can do it on their phone if they want, although I do find that when students write on their phones, there are a lot more typos. You can often tell when they write on their phones, but, but it did allow them a little more freedom. I think I allowed the paper journals or the online journal for a while, but then most of them did the online journal, so it certainly uh, meant that I didn't have to carry home stacks of spiral-bound notebooks, <laughs> um, so it made it easier for me, too, to flip through. I, I do think grading is faster. And when you're using the Canvas system for homework assignments because you literally can flip through so easily as opposed to um, marking through the papers. And I've gotten better at using Canvas to write. Uh, so on their papers on Canvas of using the different tools to circle things or write on the side, I've gotten better at that. Uh, at first I didn't like that very well. And I sometimes would use um, a Word document and then just upload the Word document to their assignment. Um, where I gave feedback, but I've gotten better at actually doing it on their paper on Canvas. Are there challenges with students expecting me to be like basically available 24 seven? And there are, there was one time, my husband is a runner and he was in the New York City Marathon and I was out on Sunday all day in the park, you know, watching him, looking for him cross the finish line or whatever. And I remember there was a student, I got home and there were this string of emails. Where are you? Are you there? Why are you not answering? Where are you? And it was, you know, a Sunday. Um, and it had been, you know, maybe five hours. I mean, it wasn't even so. Yes, yeah, sometimes because I am largely available answering emails, then if I'm not, they get frustrated because, you know, where are you? Why are you not answering me? But of course, when I emailed the student instead, my husband was in the New York City Marathon. I was at the park all day. She was like, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. You know, so, I mean, it was fine, but it was sort of funny that then they get that expe expectation. I do think you know, if, if they're looking at from professor to professor, so most of us in our MFA 
dance program, we lay out the courses from beginning to end so that they can see what's coming. And I do that partly because they are professionals and some of them go on tour, they're touring with a dance company or touring with a, um, a musical theater production. And so it helps them to know what's coming to plan their lives. If they need to work ahead or ask for an extra week on something, it helps them plan their lives. But we have um, one professor right now who's not doing that because she really doesn't want them to have access to every module. Um, she wants them to work on one module and then work on the next and not know all that's coming up. And that's frustrating. I've had several phone calls um, from the students about that. So if that makes sense, one, how one professor teaches, then sometimes they get an expectation that everyone else needs to teach the same way. And you know, professors have reasons for why they open the whole course up or they only have one module at a time. That's their prerogative. What advice do I give new faculty or faculty who haven't taught before as they're coming in? Or maybe they've been teaching for years but haven't taught online, and what are some of the suggestions I might give? One is to really plan. So I know that I'm not as busy in January, and I know that I'm not as busy in August, so I try to get my courses completely set up from start to finish. Even if I choose not to open all the assignments yet, everything's already set up. Um, in January before the course starts, and in August before the course starts in September. And I think that planning is really important. I find when teachers are just sort of trying to keep up with, um, oh, I've got to put that assignment up, oh, I've got to write in that new thing, that it can um, make more uh, frustration and anxiety, that you build more anxiety for yourself. So I think working ahead helps a lot. Try to get to know your students as individuals as much as you can. And I know there's, um, well, this is one thing with our MFA course, we have so I teach a research writing and publication course. And we had students in that course who were struggling with like run-on sentences and understanding what a run-on sentence is. Others who had published extensively already. And so there's um, a differentiation that needs to happen uh, if you're teaching a course that has a wide range of students. And certainly our MFA students do depending on what you're teaching them. So for instance, the one who was working the run-on sentences, I would send him resources. I suggested he work with the writing center, which he did, and he got much better at it. And then one of the ones who had published so much, I actually was helping her develop her writing for assignments for the course for publication. So I, you know, there was a huge range of the kind of instruction I was giving based on the student's needs.